Hi, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me now. Um, I'll ask that if you can't hear me, and maybe Liz, you can just type in the chat box real quick to see if you can hear me. It's Teresa Ramos, uh, Vice President of Public Policy here at Illinois Action for Children, and we're just going to make sure everyone can hear, uh, and then we will go ahead and get started. The pound, the scar one didn't. I'm just checking real quick to make sure everyone can hear. It's registering that we're talking, but I'll just ask anyone who's in attendance to let me know if you can hear. You can hear, but not see the screen. All right, so now you should be able to hear and to see the screen. So we're going to go ahead and get started because we have a lot to get through. Um, but I am thrilled that you've all joined us for um, uh, the webinar on this report, Searching for Child Care Stories of Cook County Mothers. And I'm here with Marsha Stoll and Lorena Lara, who are the co-authors of this report. Um, that we do every year at Illinois Action for Children. Um, but this year's report is different and special, and you will find out why as we go through. So I just want to give folks on the line a quick um, overview of who we are at Action for Children. So we are primarily a child care resource and referral agency um, serving Cook County. There are 16 uh, CCRNRs across the state, and we help parents who call us or connect with us really help them find the child care that they say that they need for their children. Um, we do a bunch of other things. We're a large organization. We provide uh, support to providers as they try to work to um, improve quality or do specialized types of programs. We uh, do things for mental health consultation to administering um, uh, child food programs. And then we also, where we're at, and we're so glad that you can join us today and see our beautiful new logo, um, is at the Sylvia Costin Center for Research and Policy Innovation. And that really is the group that houses our research team and our policy team and our community engagement team that are working really to understand programs that we do at Action for Children at this large agency of over 500 people. Um, and what's happening in the field of child care and early education. So we do research on our own programs, research on the state and city and statewide data, and then we take all those learnings and turn them into policy recommendations and policy action. And so that's where this work is housed, and that's our beautiful new logo. So once again, welcome everybody. I'm so excited that you're here, and I'm going to turn it over to Marsha and Lorena because uh, I want to get right into this special edition of what is our annual report that we do on supply and demand of child care in Cook County. Um, and we will save some time, we'll give them some time to go through their uh, presentation and then we'll save some time at the end for Q&A and discussion and some of the next steps that you can take. But all the while, if you have questions, please feel free to dump them in the chat box. We will monitor them and then bring them up um, when Marsha and Lorraine are done. Thanks everyone. Hello everyone, this is Lorena Lara, and I want to briefly talk about the project, um, how we came up with this idea. So uh, this year we decided to do more qualitative research projects to better understand the experiences and challenges of parents as they, tr as they try to search for childcare. We're particularly interested in interviewing parents who were looking for care during non-traditional hours, care for children with special needs, infant care, and care in child care desert areas. We began interviewing in August of 2018 and we finished in early 2019. 
The entire interview period ranged from four to seven weeks per participant. We recruited parents from a child care referral team. When a parent calls our referral hotline, consultants will ask parents for their child care needs. Then, consultants will give them a list of options that match, match the criteria. Parents who call us are usually seeking formal licensed child care. So we interview parents at three different points, at the start, during, and towards the end of their search. We interview 17 parents. Out of those 17, 11 completed all three interviews. At the end of their interview, they got a $50 gift card for their participation. All participants were mothers who needed care from infants through 12 years old. Most were employed in low wages jobs or they were looking for a job. All but two were single. Five spoke a primary language other than English. Four spoke Spanish, one spoke Russian. And as you can see in the map, they all live throughout um, Cook County. Seven live in Chicago and 10 live in a suburban area. We started asking mothers what they, what they wanted in their childcare, and they brought up some various logistical needs, such as being close to home, affordable, open at the right times, and wheelchair accessible. Then they talked about what they wanted from the providers. Many wanted a provider that they could trust. As I mentioned, they wanted cameras in the centers or the home, only females changing diapers, and the one parent said, just be a responsible person and treat my girl right. Some mention safety and cleanliness. For, for instance, first, I will make sure they are, clean, they are clean. Some talked about doing activities with the children. I want them to actually interact with my baby. Those parents with a special needs child want someone who understands the disability of the child. One parent said, sensitive to his autism and his special needs. When we asked about the type of care they preferred, seven were interested in, cent in a center care. Usually, this was related to trust issues. As they felt centers were more regulated, they have cameras and offer social interaction. Four were interested in home care. They felt that smaller study will mean ch children will get more attention and six were okay with either a center or home. Almost all of them wanted, wanted care to be licensed. Only two moms said it would be nice, but not necessary. Now we're gonna talk about mother's experiences while they search for care. Many parents expressed their worries and concerns during this time. We heard words such as overwhelming, stuck, don't know what to do. The truth is, I feel worried. I need to work. I'm stuck right now. Next time you call me, I might be, well, I'm not working no more. I'm not sure. I'm sure I figured out something out. It's just overwhelming right now. Parents were frustrated by multiple factors. First, the lack of options. Some of them were surprised how the options were so limited and they were worried they were not gonna find care and be able to work. They also had care following through. Three parents thought they had found arrangements or started making arrangements and their care fell through. Discrimination. Two parents felt they or their child was discriminated against. One Latina mom visited a center and was told that they mainly serve Europeans. They didn't even, they didn't even let her go inside. She was told to look somewhere else. Time consuming, one mom worked at night and she had to make the call during the day when she was supposed to be sleeping. Another mother, another mother called 20 to 30 providers and still couldn't find care. Also, the system didn't work for them for multiple reasons. From the referral, from the referral side, parents wish referrals were better matched providers' willingness to care for more severe child needs. And we're gonna, we're gonna talk about it more a little bit. Also, CCAP didn't work for them for multiple reasons. Mainly, for those who were trying to um, look for a job without CCAP, uh, they, couldn't, they couldn't look for a job without care, they couldn't get care without 
um, CCAP and they can't get a job without CCAP. And also from a program perspective, the lack of right combination between school age care and transportation. Now let's talk about Melissa. Melissa is a, re is a good example of a parent who faced many frustrations. She lives in the suburbs and has a three-year-old son with zero palsy and epilepsy. He's in a wheelchair and uses a feeding tube. Her child goes to school district for daily therapy services and needs childcare for the other half of the day. First, she would like to have a better way to quickly identify programs that will care for her son's severe needs. As she said, they advertise broadly, then they pick and choose. Also, she works all day as a mail carrier and didn't really have the time to uh, find care. She will have to wait until her day off to, to visit the programs. And with the pro if the program didn't work, she will have to wait until the, her next day off. Luckily, she has some help from her mom who will make the visits. Over the phone, she thought, the program, she, she, thought she had a program then they saw her son and they said no. She felt like they were not being honest with her. As they said, they were not wheel wheelchair accessible, but she said she saw the wheelchair ramp outside the program. They also said they, they wouldn't do a free tube, uh, the G2 fitting, but over the phone, they said they could. We didn't only really ask about Uh, parents were dealing with child's mental health issues. Two moms had a teenage children hospitalized for mental health issues. One mom discussed her, say how her four-year-old son was experiencing anxiety related to um, be able to acclimate to the culture as they had just moved from South America. And he was still trying to learn um, English. Also, they had their own medical issues of depression as one mom mentioned her own depression um, and another mom had to stop um, looking for care because she had multiple medical issues. Social isolation. One woman and her children were new to Illinois and have no family or any support system here. Homelessness. Two were homeless. One was in a shelter and the other one was, was staying with someone they knew. In fact, they said that a child care program required her to show proof of address, which she couldn't. Unemployment, of course, the stress that comes to being unemployed and the time it takes to look for work. Now let's talk about Sylvia. Sylvia is another mother who had a lot of complications in her life. She is divorced due to domestic violence, which affected all her all three children. Her oldest, who is 15, experienced a clinical depression and tried to commit suicide. He was hospitalized for a week, but he seemed to be doing better. However, Sylvia said that her two youngest children were very sensitive and emotional. Sylvia felt that maybe they needed therapy. In the first interview, her, her two oldest child children had ADHD. By the second interview, she thought her youngest one also had ADHD and he was not doing so well in school. When we called um, for the second interview, she said she had to stop looking for care because she had uh, many things happening in her life. Uh, one of them was she was at the mecha mechanic when we called her. Her car wasn't working. She also had her own uh, medical problems to deal with. Her biggest challenge was trying to find work but having nowhere to leave her, ki her children. As she said, how can I be able to search for work if I, if I don't have someone to leave the children with? During their search, mothers had temporary care arrangements, but they were not sustainable. We often think families will fall back on their own resources when the system doesn't work for them. But the majority of the moms did not have family they can turn to for um, help. Eight out of 17 had help from family members, but those family members had their own obligations so they couldn't rely on them for long term. Some parents used formal care programs, but they were too costly to sustain. For example, one foster parent had twins in the after school program at their school, 
but the program did not accept vouchers from the from the Department of Children and Family Services, which is what which is what covers the foster children um, care. So she had to pay out of pocket, and she couldn't sustain this. Now back to Melissa. In, t in terms of help, she had her help mom help in the summer. She also had extended family, but they were wary of helping due to the child's needs. She said that her child is very heavy for someone who's three, almost four, and she wears a back brace when she has to lift them. At the second interview, school had started and she was using a sitter. Not only was the sitter far to get to, but this, this also meant that her, her child couldn't go to therapy. Every day without care meant her son was missing valuable services. So you have moms that have family or babysitter or other informal care. You have moms who use a more formal but, but costly care. But then you have families who have no care and had to take time out from work. Four out of the nine employed mothers who completed their interviews had to take time out from work why are they looking for care? Let's talk about Linda. Linda has a six-year-old son with autism and needed after-school care for him. She found out that all the programs were full and her job didn't allow her to do part-time. Part -time. So she had to stop working until she found care. She was not able to find care. However, she was able to get a new job with more flexible hours. Now I'm going to turn it to Marsha. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the specific child care needs and challenges of our families that fell into each of those four categories that we mentioned at the beginning. But first, I just want to, you know, make the point that there are some child care needs that are shared by all parents. For example, we all want care that's trustworthy, care that's affordable, and care in a convenient location, you know, usually close to home. But the families that we interviewed had a complex set of needs, just different needs layered on top of one another, and each additional need that they had narrowed their options even more. The first group of parents I want to look at are those who needed non-standard hours, and that was eight of the 17 mothers that we interviewed. Five needed evening care after 6 p.m., seven needed early morning care before 7 a.m., and even though we specifically targeted these families, this is a pretty common issue for families, particularly those working low-income jobs. Uh, Illinois Action for Children did a study a few years ago where we looked at families who used the Child Care Assistance Program, and we found that just about half of the families on the program worked at least some non-standard hours. So about, of our eight moms, five completed all three of the interviews, and we were able to find out if they found care or not. And of the five, three found care and two did not. I want to take a look at one of the parents who needed non-standard hours. This is Angel. She lives in the western suburbs. She has a 7-year-old and a 14-year-old daughter. She works as a school bus driver and starts work at 6 in the morning. So she needed child care that started at 5.30 for her 7-year-old. Her 7-year-old also was going to an after-school program at the school, at her school. And Angel was already paying out of pocket for that program because they didn't accept the child care assistance program. Angel didn't have any family that could help, except on weekends, occasionally, if her dad was in town, he would help watch the, her daughters. Um, but otherwise, she, it was just her and her two children. Up until recently, the 14-year-old daughter had been watching her younger sister, but, um, you know, during the call, Angel... Angel told me that her 14-year-old daughter was an in an inpatient psychiatric facility, and when she got out, she wouldn't be able to care for herself, let alone, you know, her 7-year-old sister anymore. And so that was the reason why Angel was looking for care. So Angel needed before-school care that was open by 5.30 in the morning, and that's hard to find on its own but she also needed a child care provider that could take her child to school, school in the morning. So they had to be able to tr provide transportation. Um, she also wanted care that was licensed, but it turns out, because that's what she's, she's always used licensed care and it's what she was used to, but it turns out there were no licensed providers that met these two criteria. 
Angel had been in a similar situation a few years ago when her seven-year-old was five years old, and she was able to find a licensed home care provider that was open early mornings, but that provider wasn't able to provide transportation to take her daughter to school. And so that year, her daughter went to the licensed home program, and she missed her year of kindergarten. So what happened for Angel? Like I said, there were no licensed care options in her community or in the surrounding communities near her. And in the first interview, she was unsure how to even start to find an informal care provider because she, she didn't have anyone in her own social network, and so she had no leads. As of the second interview, though, she had, um, she had discovered a sitter locator service where you place an ad and providers can respond to your ad. And through there, she found a young woman who was um, willing to provide care. But this woman had to travel a bit of a distance to get to Angel's home in the morning, and so she was a little worried that it may not last, that this provider might find it too inconvenient to, to provide care long term. And also, the care was more than she could afford. It was $25 a day, and so she was paying that on top of $200 a month for the after-school program, and um, so that was expensive for her. And at the same time, she worried that it was not enough to keep her provider so to cover the extra cost, she began working some extra weekend routes, some charters on the weekend. And if her dad was in town, he would watch the kids for her while she worked. But if he wasn't in town, she had to take her daughters with her on the routes. And these were usually all day routes. And it was against her employer's policy to take her children. And so it means she was also putting her job at risk. Angel actually liked the provider. She liked the care and she says, my little daughter, she really loves her. It's real convenient for me. It's just expensive. She liked that she didn't have to wake her daughter up in the morning and get her dressed and take her to childcare, but it just was not affordable. As of the last call that we had with her, um, she was looking into the child care assistance program to see if she was eligible, but she was a little worried that it, she, she, did, she wasn't sure it'd be worth it because for the child care assistance program, the part day rate for a non-licensed provider was about $8.50 a day, and then minus her co-payment, and so she didn't know if that amount would, was really worthwhile. And on top of that, if you have a provider on the Child Care Assistance Program, this person has to submit a state ID and a Social Security card. They have to pass a criminal background check, which involves getting fingerprinted. They have to complete 11 hours of health and safety training, including an in-person CPR training, and they have to receive an annual monitoring visit. And I don't know if Angel knew all of this. She was just kind of learning all these requirements. And um, already she was really wary of just asking the provider for her social security number for tax purposes. So I'm not sure if she found all this out, I don't know if she would even ask that provider or if that provider would be willing to provide to go through all that and get paid by the Child Care Assistance Program. So the next group of parents we want to look at are those who need care for a child with special needs. And eight of the 17 mothers had a child with special needs. Of the eight, six of the moms completed the three interviews. And of the six, two could not find care specifically because no provider would accommodate their child's needs. And then another four who had children with more moderate needs, um, autism or ADHD, of these four, three found care and one did not. And this mom, she attributed more to a lack of openings and the timing of her search than her child's autism. Um, though, you know, the autism was an important factor for her and she needed a provider that worked well with him. It, he was a school age child and she was looking for care mid-year and she really thought it was the timing uh, of her search that was why she couldn't find any openings and so that was more a limiting factor for her than her son's autism. So I'd like to talk about the two moms who didn't find care and one is, is back to Melissa. So as of the last interview, Melissa had still not found care. Lorena had mentioned that her extended family wasn't was a little wary of providing care because of his severe needs, but by the third interview, they were providing care. And she says, he's been able to go to school and receive therapy, and that really impacts him. He just recently began standing in his walker, and she was really happy about that. Also in the last interview, she said that she was talking to some home providers, and she found one who 
personally couldn't watch her son because her son was very heavy and this provider had a bad back and wasn't able to lift him. But she knew of some other providers in her own informal network who cared for children with special needs. And um, she was working really hard to connect Melissa to these other providers. And it just made me think that, you know, I wish all parents with a child with special needs really had an advocate like, like this provider was for Melissa and that all parents could tap into these types of networks. Sonia was the other mom who didn't find care. She, has, uh, she was on the south side of Chicago and has a 12-year-old and 16-year-old daughters. Her 12-year-old has epilepsy and she was looking for after-school care for, the, for her 12-year-old. Um, her 12-year-old had been with a licensed home provider who moved away. And um, she said during the seven years she was with this provider, she had never had a seizure because she only has seizures at night or if her child's sick. And if her child's sick, she doesn't take her to child care. So in her opinion, her daughter's epilepsy, she didn't see it as um, so much of a challenge for, for providers. She said all they have to do is open her backpack, give her the medicine, and call me as soon as possible. Um, so her daughter also has an IEP, an individualized education program, at her public school, between, between, you know, with her public school that says that the school will accommodate her by providing her one-on-one -on -one care. So during the school day, she has an aide. And I think she, she, talked, she showed the IEP to the providers when she was talking to them because it turns out um, the providers, when they saw the IEP, they said that they felt her daughter's condition was too dangerous. She says, they tell me that because of the illness my daughter has, because she has an IEP, she does not qualify. So she couldn't find any providers that would take her daughter. At first, her, the daughter's school aide was providing care after school as well. But the aide was reassigned districts. And so as of the last call, so the aide wasn't, wasn't um, nearby anymore and not able to provide after school care. And as of the last call, Sonia's older daughter was providing care for her younger sister on weekends when she was working. And also there were one or two days when the older daughter got out of school early and had to go watch her younger sister. On the other days when the 16 year old was not available, Sonia had to leave work early. And she was able to leave work early because she was eligible for the Family Medical Leave Act, FMLA, because of her daughter's epilepsy. But if you know FMLA, you know that it's time limited and it's not paid. And so we don't know how long Sonia could sustain this. She was supposed to be working 40 hours a week, but she was working more like 30 or 31 hours. And so that's a quarter of her wages that she was probably losing because she couldn't find childcare. The next group of moms we looked at were those who needed infant care. We interviewed four moms who needed infant care. Three of the four felt that they lacked options, and because of this, two wished they had started their search earlier. Two of the four, on top of looking for infant openings, also had additional needs. They both needed evening care as well, and then one of the moms also was looking for transportation for her school-aged child, and that complicated her search even more. There was one couple who were looking for care because even though they really liked the center that their infant daughter was in, it was too costly for them. They were receiving child care assistance, but the payments that the child care assistance payment program were making to her center didn't meet the full cost of care. And so the center was asking her and her husband to pay the difference. So this is extra money they had to pay on top of the co-payment that they were already assigned to pay through the child care assistance program. And on this chart here, uh, the bar on the left shows the rate that the child care assistance program will pay for an infant care in a center in Cook County. And it's $1,050 a month. And then the bar on the right shows the going rate for infant care in Cook County for, in a center. And we don't know what uh, the rate was in her in this couple's particular community, but if it was similar to the average rate in Cook County, it would be about $1,221. So that's a difference of $170 a month. And so that's a lot for them to be paying on top of their copayment. 
I want to talk about Catherine. She's the mom who not only needed infant care, but she also needed the transportation for her school-aged daughter and the evening care as well. She just got off maternity leave, and she started a new job with standard nine to five hours, but she had a long commute into the city, and it was with the traffic. She couldn't guarantee that she'd be back by 6 p.m. when most child care programs closed. So she was looking for evening care as well. She had family that could help. She says it's like different family members here and there who can help me. So Catherine needed a provider or a combination of providers who had an infant opening, is open past 6 p.m., and can pick up her seven-year-old from school. And Catherine was the one who called 20 to 30 places. And she still, in the end, did not find care. She said, um, you know, in terms of infant openings, everybody was either full or they already had their limit for babies. And she said she appreciated that programs limited the number of babies that they cared for because it meant they were giving them a lot of attention, but it just meant there were no open slots for her child. She was willing to look for care in neighboring suburbs, but the further she went from home, it just meant the harder it was for her to get to the provider by 6 p.m. So as of the last call, Catherine was piecing together care by her family, and then when that didn't work out, she was taking time off work. And since it was a new job for her, you know, that was pretty risky for her to have to take off work so soon into a new job. And it's also likely that she didn't have a lot of paid time at that point. She was likely losing wages. And then our fourth category that we looked at was care in child care deserts. You know, we, some communities just have very few options to begin with. And then when you layer on the other needs of families, it just made it even more challenging for them. And suburban school age care was one that kept coming up again and again as being particularly challenging. And we're going to talk about that in a little more detail in a minute. Parents who lived in these child care deserts were willing to travel for care, but the extra travel sometimes meant they weren't able to, you know, get there for, on, for the pickup on time, like in the case of Catherine, or it meant that they weren't able to get to work on time if they had to travel farther away from their job. And then, you know, t getting child care further from home also meant that if they had a school-aged child who needed transportation, or even a younger child in the case of Melissa who needed transportation, the further they, they were from their home, the less likely that the child care program would provide transportation to that child's school. So this is Jennifer, and she is a mother who lived in a child care desert. She was a mom of five foster children, ages three to seven. On top of being in a location with very few options, she was also needed a provider or a combination of providers who had experience with autism. This, she had a seven-year-old with autism. She also needed a provider that would accept DCFS vouchers, and that's the program that pays for childcare for children, foster children. She needed a program that would accept multiple children because she had five and she didn't want to be making a, a lot of pickups and drop-offs. And then the programs had to be able to transport her school-age kids to or from school. So Jennifer, she was also willing to travel for care because there were a few options in her community, but she was one of the parents who ran into the issue where she found a place, but it, it was far, far enough from home that they wouldn't transport her kids to school. But the biggest challenge for Jennifer was finding programs that would accept the DCFS vouchers. She had two children in a center already who were received, paid through DCFS vouchers, and she would prefer to have all of her children in that same center. It met all of her needs. They had a nice preschool classroom for a three-year-old, but that center didn't want to accept any more children through DCFS. And um, because those payments are usually, they're quite delayed. And so they weren't willing to take her other three children. So in the end, Jennifer did find a licensed home provider. It was really the last place on her list, and it ended up working out for her. I just want to touch quickly on school age care because it was so common in the, among the parents that we interviewed. It wasn't one of the themes that we were particularly looking at, 
but a lot of parents face challenges. And some of those that they face were that their schools did not have before or after school programs. If they did have them, they didn't accept the child care assistance or the DCFS vouchers. Um, they didn't bus children to or from other care. And sometimes it's because they didn't have bus service altogether because it was a small school district and most families lived close enough to school that they could walk, so there was no bus service. And in other cases, uh, the parent didn't live far enough from the school to be eligible for the bus service, or the parent you know, found a spot, an opening in a child care center, but it wasn't one of the child care centers that the school district would bus to. And then another problem they ran into with using uh, child care at the school is that when the school was closed for a holiday or had a special schedule, usually the school didn't provide child care at those times and then they had to find other child care or take off work. And then for the off-site child care programs, if they found an opening at those programs, then they ran into the challenge that many of those programs didn't provide transportation to or from their school. So there was a mismatch there of finding an opening and then at a place that also provided transportation to their school. And then the last thing I want to talk about is something that um, was an issue for most of our parents, and this is affordability. There are these programs to help parents pay for child care, the child care assistance program for low-income parents who can earn up to 200% of the poverty level or are in school, and then the DCFS program to help foster children. But some of the barriers that parents ran into <laughs> to using these programs was first that the programs weren't available to parents who didn't have a job. So those who were trying to job search weren't eligible for the, for the assistance. Um, also, we had a parent who was over the CCAP income limit, which meant she was pushed off the program before she was really financially able to pay for the care herself. Care was affordable even with the voucher for some families. Like the couple who had an infant in a child care center, you know, and had to pay the difference between what the state would pay and what the center charged. Some programs didn't accept vouchers or had a limit, like in the case with Jennifer, the foster mom. And then parents weren't always sure of the provider requirements, and then when they learned of them, whether their provider would be willing to complete those requirements. And that was usually an issue with non-licensed care. So the impact of these barriers on parents is that they were paying more than they could afford, like the case of Angel, the bus driver, who had to take on these extra hours. They had to turn down viable care options. And, you know, these are families where their options are already limited. And if they can find a slot, you know, the last thing we want is for them to not be able to take that slot because of issues related to their ability to access the child care assistance program. And then finally, we had parents who found it difficult to job search, and that, were, that was three parents of the 17. So I'm going to turn it back to Lorena to recap the outcomes of the families that were looking for care. From the 11 mothers that completed all three interviews, four did not find care. As you remember Melissa, she still relied on family and still looking. However, like Marsha said, she was able to find a group of providers who were willing to work with her to find her care. Sonia, she also didn't find care, and she's using her FMLA benefits um, for her missing child care, um, which means she's likely losing a quarter of her wages. Linda, she had to find a new job with more flexible hours, and she said she was going to look out for care again later. Catherine relies on her family, who is not always too, who's not always too consistent. Um, so she's new to her job, and when her child care doesn't work out, she has to take time off. Some mothers found care, but they had to make compromises. For instance, Angel, who was a bus driver, she has to work extra hours to pay for her care, which means she has to bring her ch children to, her, um, to the bus, which it means she's violating the employer's policy. Also, at first, she said she wanted more formal license care, but instead she got a sitter. And although she likes to sit her, she does find it a little strange, uh, risky to have a stranger in her home. And then Jennifer, the mother with five foster children. She was able to find um, care, 
but now she has to make multiple pickups and drop-offs instead of one. Also, her three-year-old foster child is in a home care rather than a formal preschool program. Most mothers, most mothers were satisfied with their care. As you recall, Sylvia, who was new to the uh, Chicago area, she had no family and no support system. In every interview, she emphasized how, how, her family, how she and her family didn't have anyone, and her children only have her. She was very mistrusting of home care, but couldn't find an after-school program. Either they didn't have the openings, or they didn't provide transportation, or they were too far. However, she found a neighbor who stays home to care for her own parents. And she said, if something happened to me, she will be at home nearby. My children do, do not have anyone. That gives me confidence. She invited me to her home. I can see that she's calm, responsible. The children eat homemade food. The children are happy. If this care works out for her, not only will she get child care, but she will also get the support system that she needs. Great. I just want to also recap some of the themes that we've talked about over the, through these stories. One is that families have complicated lives and an urgent need to work. We need to keep the child care system simple for easy access. Gaps in the child care system lead to more burdens on the family, and many families lack support systems to fill this gap, and that includes social networks and financial resources. Families have multiple care needs, and if we just solve for one and a piecemeal approach, it may not always be enough. You know, there's the phrase, if you build it, will they come? You know, if we just focus on evening care and we build a center that has evening hours, for example, but we don't consider the special care needs or the transportation needs of the families, then that may not work for families. So we need to think more holistically. So now on to some policy implications. So the first one is how we can improve access to child care through changes to the Child Care Assistance Program and DCFS child care. One is to cover the cost of care during parent job search. This will allow parents to get care right away, right when they need it, and not have to be in that catch-22 situation where they can't get care because they don't have a job. Second is to increase the income threshold for CCAP eligibility so parents aren't pushed off the system before they earn enough to really pay for the full cost of care. We can incentivize programs to accept CCAP through provider-friendly practices, and these include higher reimbursement rates, which will also allow providers to provide more higher quality care. We can provide payments based on enrollment versus attendance, which is how providers often charge their private pay clients. We can provide pre-service payments where payments are made at the beginning rather than at the end of the month. Currently, the state makes payments retroactively the month after when care is provided. And we can also use more state contracts where programs are given more funding to administer the child care assistance program themselves for their families. This provides a little more stability for programs. And then a final idea we might consider, and we didn't talk about this with the parents today, but it, it did come up with the parents we interviewed, is the idea of presumptive eligibility. And this is where we cover the cost of care while the parent application is being processed. Um, this, you know, we have parents who can't get childcare. You know, it can take a good two weeks before parents find out whether they're eligible for childcare, and many childcare programs don't want to take the risk of taking a family in and then not getting paid when they find out that family is not eligible. And so if we pay those providers regardless of parent, whether they're eligible or not, then that takes some of the risk away and allows parents to get that care they need right away so that as soon as they find out, for example, that they've gotten a job, they can, they can get started working right away. We can also expand the supply of hard-to-find care through incentives such as startup grants, higher CCAP rates, or CCAP contracts. And for higher CCAP rates, like right now, the CCAP program does not provide any additional funding to care for a child with special needs. And so higher rates could incentivize providers to pr provide care for more children with special needs and help cover some of the costs of equipment or training they may need. 
And we can also use higher rates to incentivize evening care or weekend care and other hard to find care during those non-standard hours. Um, we can expand technical support available to home providers who would like to become licensed. In Cook County, as well as in Illinois and nationally, the number of home providers has been declining. And home providers are really important to the childcare sector because they provide a lot of that hard to find care. They're much more likely than centers to provide evening care and also more likely to provide care during for children with special needs. And so by providing more assistance for providers who'd like to become licensed, you know, that's a very complicated process to get your license. And so that's one way we can support them better. Also, we can provide a robust system of supports for care for children with special needs. And this includes provider training, funding to buy the equipment, to have coaching, aids, including one-on-one -on -one aids that children may need, and also to pay staff for, pay for substitutes so that staff can have planning time to work with other service providers in that child's life, like EI therapists or special education therapists, so that care can be coordinated among all the child's service providers. And this system, you know, we could also improve, we could also have advocates for families who really work on behalf of families in a deeper way than we do right now to find care for their children with special needs and, and build up that capacity of providers so, there's, so they're better able to accommodate that family. Finally, we can enhance the referral program and its data. For example, we could have a provider portal so that providers could update their own data in real time, whether they have a vacancy and any changes to their, to their um, profile. And we can also more, we can collect more specific data on providers' capacity to accommodate special needs so that our referral specialists are able to make better referrals for families. Thanks, Marsha and Lorena. So it's Teresa again, and I wanna quickly go through um, some policy implications for the Funding Commission, and then I wanna um, come back to one or two points that Marsha and Lorena made in the report and talk about, um, or in the presentation, and then uh, ask them to, to also talk about a little bit of what they'll find in the report that you don't find in this presentation. So, um, a few things here, right? State funding should cover the cost of childcare for job seekers. We, we have seen that pretty consistently, not only in the research for this report, but as we have been in the field for about a, um, a year working on our policy agenda, um, that really this is a sticking point for a lot of parents. Um, we need to make a decision as a state that child care and early education programs are a public good and that the state should take up the responsibility for covering the cost of those programs. We have seen that time and time again in many presentations, and in fact, uh, Action for Children has a Spring into Action conference on April 28th in Springfield, and Jeff Nagel will be presenting his um, presentation on the importance of the first 1,100 days of a child's life. And if you haven't seen it, you should totally register and come. We'll send a follow-up email, but it really talks about how important those years are for all future success in uh, education and beyond. Uh, we clearly need additional funding um, for child care and early education. And this is one of the things that is you'll find in the report that we didn't hit on here, which is really when you think when you look at how expensive uh, the cost of care is, we have tons of data on um, how much child care costs. And there's a, a really good uh, chart on page 19 of the report if you go in there and you're looking at it about affordability for uh, parents seeking infant and toddler care. Uh, if you don't qualify for the child care assistance program, that means you're, uh, you could be at 201% of the federal poverty level, which just for context is about $43,000. Um, for a family of three, uh, you would have to pay uh, the full price of care, and that would be roughly about 32, average 32% of your income. Even if you made uh, around 400% of the federal poverty level, which would be close to $85,000 a year, you're still paying 16% of your income. It's not until you're at, and I got this wrong yesterday, but it, it's not until you're really at um, close to $200,000 
which is 922% of the federal poverty level, that you're at 7% of, you're spending roughly 7% of your income on uh, infant and toddler care, uh, which is 7% is what the, the feds say is considered affordable for families. So that kind of data you will find in the report that we didn't feature here in part because we found these stories to be so compelling. Um, so we know we need additional funding and we know we need to make sure that more families, especially those that fall outside of this, the income threshold for CCAP, really have some access to public funds to support uh, paying for their care. Um, I think most folks know that in December, uh, Governor Prinsker launched a funding commission to really take on evaluating uh, the, the funding formula for child care and early education. And while many of the recommendations that we just went through are about the existing system, we recognize that some of those systems might go away or might change. And so there are things that the Funding Commission can do based on how it's even thinking about um, the, the funding in the future. Um, so incorporating key kind of cost factors into our calculation of what it costs to really provide high quality or excellent care. Um, and we heard, again, not just in this report, but when we were around the state, we really need uh, better uh, embedded supports, wraparound supports for students with special needs and additional funding for that. That's not currently how the system works. You heard Marsha and Larry talk a little bit about the travel expenses you need to, to take to get a student um, who's involved in an early intervention program to a school district where they're offering it. Um, we make it very hard for parents and for providers to provide care for special needs students. And it's something that we could incorporate in the calculation of cost moving forward. And just like in K-12, transportation is a huge cost factor. We know that we're not um, providing enough funding for providers to you know, get transportation for uh, parents and families. And I think one of the most compelling things, and I'm totally stealing from Marsha and Lorena, you know, heard, heard her stories about how, you know, one um, parent didn't send her uh, daughter to kindergarten because she could not get care that would provide transportation to the school district and back, right? And so just reemphasizing how hard we're making it for uh for parents and families, and it, and it doesn't have to be that way. And then, you know, we can enhance not just state capacity infrastructure to deliver more meaningful referrals, and Marsha outlined some of those um, strategies, but we can enhance the state capacity infrastructure to do a lot of things to support providers. I don't want anyone to take away that, you know, the, the challenge here lies with providers. Um, the, the challenge really is in the system, and I appreciate those folks, on, everyone who's joined us on the call today, um, and especially those folks who are funding commission members or are on work groups, um, because we wanted to give you kind of a perspective of having talked directly to parents. Here's what parents are saying. Um, and tomorrow we are having a, a similarly brief webinar to walk through from the provider perspective how hard it is to um, identify, braid, and blend funding streams in order to cover the price of care. The one point that I wanted to go back to um, is on this slide. So Marta talked about like, you know, the, the CCAP rate and the market rate. So the Child Care Assistance Program, uh, what it does essentially is it sets, it does a, a market rate survey uh, every year. Uh, Samir will correct me if I'm, or anybody here will correct me if I get anything wrong as the layperson here. Um, and it sets a market rate, you know, in, a, in an area for the price of care, which is different from, we would make a distinction between the price of care and the cost of care, right? The price of care is really this market rate survey, the survey of what the market in the community can actually bear. The cost of care and the cost of excellent care is actually higher than the market rate, right? It's not a calculation of what parents in, can afford. It's really saying if you want excellent care and you want to be able to pay teachers well and provide benefits, which we know is not what's happening even in centers that are excellent, they're still struggling or just not actually paying uh, workers a uh, competitive salary and benefits. You would add a third bar here that talks about cost that is much uh, higher than the market rate or the CCAP rate. And so those types of things we will, you'll, you'll, um, 
we will have, as we kind of explain the system to funding commission members um, and others tomorrow. If you are on, on the line right now and you want to be part of that webinar tomorrow or you want us to send it to you afterwards, um, just let, it, let us know. A few other things that you'll find in the report, um, and I'm just going to walk you through them in part because I put Marshall Lorraine on the spot, and, and I have the report right in front of me. You'll just see how kind of the, the child care um, reimbursement rates have changed over time and have not kept pace with even the, the price of care, let alone cost. You'll see breakdown about availability of slots for different types of care by different regions within Cook County. So we have uh, many more uh, many more maps, and then you'll see breakdowns too of like, you know, where there is an, is an availability for um, a care like non-standard hours care, and a little bit more on what we heard were the biggest factors for um, for parents for in choosing their type of care, right? Beyond those kind of that trifecta that Marsha talked about in the beginning of you know, really having a place that they could uh, trust that was near them in location and and was affordable. And you'll note in that, right, that what didn't come up is parents searching for some notion of what excellent care is because when you're that strapped, when you, we may get so hard to find care, the first three things you want to figure out is, like, can you trust this place to keep your kid uh, healthy and safe? Is this some place where I can actually get to and can manage, you know, my... my um, work and can I afford to do this, right? So um, I hope you all found it as compelling as we found it here, that they're uh, brilliant research. And I'm going to pause right now and open it up to any questions. Okay. So folks want to can tap questions in the question box or um, I think if you raise your hand, we can also like let everybody go on the audio, but Liz would have to figure that out. So just to get things started, um, I would ask, um, you know, this is a report on Cook County. Do you think you would find, you know, Marshall, anything different if we were to do something statewide? Um, I think we would, because even in this study, it was just Cook County. But when we were talking to people from Chicago and I saw and outside Chicago, the ones in suburban area, they were saying, well, this is not Chicago. We don't have that many options. So even when th within this study, we were seeing some differences. So I would think that's only we were just the statewide approach will be different as well. I would agree. I think we'd see some of the same theme, overarching themes. But this was just a pretty small sample of 17 families. And if we even just doubled that to 34 families, I think it would reveal even more difficulties and dilemmas that families face. And I think we'd get a little bit of the local, uh, more, more, more sense of the di differences between communities. And I think that's important. Yeah. I and mean, one thing that strikes me is how important transportation was here. And we're not, we didn't talk to anybody really in a rural area. And that's just got to be even more exaggerated mm -hmm. in places outside of the Collar County. So, great. What, what did you um, find most surprising? Because you guys have been in this for a while. So, like, what did you find surprising about um, this research? Um, I think to me it was, I mean, I knew finding um, care for special needs was difficult, but I wasn't aware of this whole Melissa situation where they would say yes, and then they would say no. Like, I was just like, I wonder what's happening. Where's the gap between when they're saying yes and then when, why they're saying no um, when it comes to actually um, taking the child in. So that was surprising to me. Yeah, and I guess I was really shocked when I heard Angel's story about her child not going to kindergarten. You know, I didn't realize that that happened, that that was happening with families. And, you know, we weren't expecting to hear so many stories about the school age care. And I just thought if you're providing school age care, you've kind of thought through and worked out the transportation needs of families. So I didn't really realize there was such a mismatch there. Um, you know, and it, it is so important that we focus on zero to four because it's such an important age. But if we don't pay enough attention to school age, and then the child can't go to kindergarten, and then all that investment, you know, just up through age four, you know, then what, you know. So I think, you know, issues of school age care can affect the whole family, like in the case of Sonia, where her, she was losing a quarter of her ages because, sorry, a quarter of her wages because her 12-year-old, she couldn't find care for her 12-year-old with epilepsy. 
And so that's, that would affect the whole family, the younger kids in that family as well. So, um, yeah, no, it's shocking. And I think, I don't know if most folks know that in Illinois, kindergarten is not compulsory. It's not mandated yet you actually start school until first grade. Now, that doesn't actually solve for this challenge, right? Apparently, like, you would just, I think, you have to have an even harder time finding and affording care in this instance. But it's just, as a side note, not um, it's not against the, the law or rule in any way to not send your kid to kindergarten, even though we know we want all kids in kindergarten. I'm going to point out the other thing that I think um, Marsha hit on today and, and hit on yesterday in, in our event, too, that I want to just reemphasize is this slide about, you know, um, the additional layers that families who were searching for this hard-to-find care, the things that they needed, so accommodating special needs, has infant opening, and as you look at these kind of overlapping bubbles, you know, one of the things that Marsha has consistently said is we can't just solve for one piece here. We have to solve for all of these pieces together because this is the if you build it, will they come question, right? We When we think about what the the task is for the funding commission um, and for all of us as we think about changing the system. We really got to design, design and incentivize and make it easy for providers, whether they're homes or centers, to provide these types of care and difficult for to do the, the other way. And right now, the system is, is completely reversed. Okay. Um, beyond these immediate policy recommendations, is there more that the government or that the state could be doing, do you think, to support these families and their needs? Well, as I said in our, at our event yesterday, I think that the, the problem of families needing care during non-standard work hours shouldn't just fall solely on the child care sector, that it should be a responsibility of employers, too, to think about the child care needs of their workers and the hours they're going to ask them to work. And I think there's things that the government can do to disincentivize care that, you know, non-standard care. So that's one thing. I think we could also better coordinate the care for special needs children among programs. You know, you have coordinate, the care, coordinate between child care, special ed services, and early intervention. And that, I mean that like it's, for each individual child, but I think there's things at the state level that could be better coordinated so that those, that's happening also at the local level. Yeah, no, those both, um, I think, make a lot of sense to me. And then we, you know, heard some, um, I think one of the things definitely yesterday was really thinking about how we target this report to employers, right, to, to really understand the trade-offs their employees are making right, as we have more and more of the jobs look like non-standard hours jobs, and I'm thinking about, like, you know, the, the amount of Amazon uh, packages being shipped and those, like, you know, Amazon Primes and all those those jobs that really do require non-standard hours, what can employers be doing and how does the state support, you know, incentivize employers to really be doing more um, to support child care for their employees, for sure. Um, so um, we don't have any questions yet, but we do have a couple of comments that um, have been echoing what Marcia and Lorena were saying in the report. Um, so we have one home child care provider um, listening who made a comment that overall it's hard on parents and providers to find the right fit and quality of care, um, and that's a really special relationship um, that needs to be built. Um, we also have a participant saying that there, um, she realized there were barriers but didn't realize how many layers of barriers that can end up stopping a child from attending kindergarten, um, and that was an eye-opening message. Um, and then another participant can see why there's a gap um, between the provider saying yes um, to an interview or seeing a child. Um, with special needs and then um, maybe going back on that because the provider might have to hire additional help, um, aids, or training um, to provide great service to that family. Yeah, and that point, that last point uh, came up yesterday and we had some providers in the audience, one of whom said, you know, 
it's hard because they they might they'll get more context. So let's say like an action for children refers a family to a particular provider. We are going to probably provide less detail about what that child's care needs are than a, a parent would. Like they, the parent's going to provide them the most detail on that front. And so, and then when the, the parent and the child come in, they'll get even a better understanding of what's happening. Um, and they'll, it's likely that it's going to require them to do additional training for their, their staff training that they haven't done yet, which will take them, you know, maybe a few days, maybe longer to get their staff up to speed. And the discussion yesterday was very much, you know, and that can be somewhat intimidating for staff who have no kind of health or medical background to be thinking that they're on the line for really like making sure that that child stays healthy and safe. And so it just requires more providers and there's not typically additional support that comes down from the state to make that process easier uh, for providers or parents. Okay, our next question is, did any of the providers or facilities accept other public early learning funding like Head Start? Head Start seems to have a lot more resources and requirements for children with disabilities, and it's troubling to hear that children in this study were denied services. So I'm not sure that we went to, we, I, we didn't do an analysis of where the um, families and children ended up and then look at their um, supports. We will tomorrow, and I'm happy to share again that out with folks, um, talk about how dollars do get braided and blended and the most common braiding and blending of head, like whether it's Head Start or PFA or CCAP. You know, one of the things though that as we try to untangle this web of funding streams, we find is no one funding stream really can cover the price of care in most places, let alone the cost of excellent care. And so providers are really forced to make sacrifices in the types of services that they would otherwise love to provide that would get close to excellent care. Um, and that's more common than I think uh, folks uh, realize. The other thing is, um, and again, we'll hit on this tomorrow for those interested, but for um, Head Start and for PFA, the, the target really is families that are closer to 100% of the federal poverty level. That is, those are the families that they're looking for to, and looking to serve. Once you get over that threshold, there's there typically, there's some leeway, I think it's up to 10% for Head Start that you can take that are well over that threshold, could be up to potentially 400%, but that's not what the programs, those are not who the programs are designed to uh, serve. And so if you have families that are still CCAP eligible because they're within 200% or maybe they're above, but they're over 100% of that income level, um, federal poverty level, their, their ability to actually get those services becomes limited because they're not the target group for Head Start. Now, some other risk factors do come into play there, but you still have a question of our providers looking to, who are providers looking to um, serve and in what community and have those providers had enough interest and then got enough training to regularly accept students who have additional special needs. And it really does run the gamut. I think, you know, again, you guys will correct me if I'm wrong, but yesterday when we talked about like, you know, there can be more uh, frequent or common types of special needs students that are can be less initially intimidating to providers than something like, as Lorena talked about, like really thinking about uh, students who need a feeding tube, right, or students who are children who have epilepsy and could need some sort of medical intervention in their care um, while they're in their care. And so all of those factors make it differently challenging for uh, providers. All right. Well, I think we're going to wrap up. We have just a few more minutes left, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, if you have other questions, um, we want to just take you through a few things. We are, um, so please do look at the report. There's a lot more information, um, which is hard to imagine. There's even more information than what you guys have presented in the report. Um, we are, so that's one of the next steps. We are doing additional webinars over the course of the next month or so on different parts of the system. If you want to be engaged in those, please email any one of us directly um, and we'll get you the links. 
we are building a coalition to support really you know the funding commission making really good recommendations to the governor's office in the state for how they can uh, better support um, families like the ones that we just heard about and we need to appropriate more dollars for child care and early education and then get these um, get these kind of reforms that the commission will make through the general assembly next uh, session and sometimes getting them through state agencies. So if you'd like to join us in being advocates, we need you. We need everybody. This is a very uh, big lift to build a system that will no longer make parents and providers have these hard choices here. Um, and then we have on on May 12th, and we'll have a save the date coming out soon. We are going to uh, release our strategic plan that hits on some of these issues and and, and many more. Um, of kind of policy actions that we think need to happen over the next five to ten years that will improve the system overall. So there's a lot um, coming up and we have many more things, a few more reports on funding, we have reports coming out on um, what's happening with uh, lead poisoning and, and lead regulations across the state. So we hope you will stay engaged and stay tuned and reach out to us if you want to continue to be uh, an advocate for children and families. So. That, that's it. Thank you all for joining. And do shoot us an email. You can shoot me an email directly if you'd like to uh, jump on a webinar tomorrow morning uh, about you know how we braid and blend funding in, in Illinois and some of the, the setbacks there. Thanks, everyone. Happy Thursday.